Welcome back in the room, everyone, and those online. Um, I'm not going to spend too long here. I'm going to hand over very quickly to my colleague, Henry Morgan, who will be running a discussion on natural capital and the future of natural capital. So over to Henry. Cool. Uh, thanks very much, Lily. Um, I did actually speak to a few of you uh, in the biome last night, and then I got completely overshadowed and outgunned by Tim Smith. So I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if you'd forgotten who I was. So yeah, I'm Henry Morgan. I work on the sustainability team as part of the infrastructure team at Foresight. Um, here today, joined by a couple of great panelists to discuss uh, what we've titled the evolution of natural capital investment. Um, and to assist me in navigating this topic, um, something that I think, as the last few sessions have shown, is very much increasingly within the social conscious, but is still a pretty fledgling area. I'm joined by Hibber Larson from Nature Finance uh, and James Cairns from Palladium. Um, and they'll have a chance to sort of introduce themselves properly a bit later on. But I thought I'd do a little bit of context setting based off what we've heard you know, over the last couple of days um, and sort of try and draw from what we've learned on the last couple of days and, and, and talk about how there are lessons to be applied and what we can learn from energy transition, sustainability transition, how that can be employed, to the, uh, employed in the future of natural capital investment. So we've heard about the positive outlook, not just for renewables um, and the surrounding infrastructure that supports it. We've heard valid arguments through lively debate for investment into both technology-focused solutions and for nature-based solutions. Um, but I think it's fair to say that technology is perhaps a long way further ahead in terms of being an investable asset class that the majority of investors are comfortable with as part of their overall, overall investment strategy. Um, Kings Mill yesterday pointed to the cost decline of renewables, uh, and he painted a very vivid picture of, of where we are in terms of the uptake of renewables as part of the energy transition. Things like the cost of solar have decreased 90%, cost of onshore wind decreased 70%, and I think there's been a global alignment behind the more sustainable choice of renewable energy, uh, which has that global alignment and the support, government support, subsidy support, and societal support has facilitated mass deployment of capital into this space to a point where they are now the cheapest form of generation um, and from a commercial perspective are the obvious choice for new, for new generation, for nations, for, for utilities, and, and, and whoever else. Uh, it's sort of the industry is now very much self-sustaining without that need for external, or you know, for the most part is self-sustaining without that need for external or governmental support. So as the various conversations have touched on, I think global recognition of the issues surrounding biodiversity loss, um, our natural world, and our natural world's ability to sustain the human population against a backdrop of population growth is becoming much, much more front of mind. However, natural capital as an investment vehicle, I think is still a long way from becoming mainstream, where you'll see mass deployment of capital into it from large institutional investors as part of their standard asset allocation. But we know, though, from the conversations that the need for investment into nature-positive outcomes is becoming clearer and clearer. Uh, Josephine, yesterday, during the debate, referenced a number of times the Dasgupta review, and, it, and that sort of maybe it stops short of providing solutions of what we need to do and the proactive steps, and hopefully we'll address some of that today, but it, it really does clearly demonstrate the global economy's reliance on a healthy and fully functioning ecosystem. Um, as, as we said, sort of over 50% of global GDP is dependent on the natural environment. So this session really does hope to draw on the example of how global alignment behind a common cause, for example, decarbonisation through renewables, but how global alignment behind a common cause might successfully manifest itself in, an, uh, in investment within the natural capital space. So what possible solutions are there, and what we want to investigate is what possible solutions are there for the scaling up of investment into natural capital that might see it become a de-risked, mainstream investment product that delivers risk-adjusted returns to a conventional investor, and that's irrespective of their ethical investment choices. They see it as the commercially advantageous investment product um, that fits within their overall por portfolio. And a couple of final points, just as with any kind of good essay question, I just want to be very clear about what we're talking about when we say natural capital investment. And I say natural capital investment is investment in nature-related economic opportunities that seek to protect, sustainably manage, and restore ecosystems, simultaneously providing human well-being and benefits for biodiversity and the climate. 
So this can span anywhere from investment into reforestation to sustainable agriculture to ocean conservation or even the restoration of degraded land. And the final point I would say as well is just to keep this as a sort of slightly more forward-looking conversation. For the sake of this session, we'll be starting from a point of acceptance that carbon credits and biodiversity credits, of which there is a huge amount of sort of conversation to be had and, and, a, and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of merit in what they're achieving, but we want to be looking beyond the use of carbon credits, which at the moment are a known entity. People are starting to deploy capital into carbon credit-backed investment opportunities. In the room, we have a number of people um, who are at the forefront of using carbon credits and putting them at the center of investment propositions. We've got Christopher Heathcote, Rob Guest, um, and uh, Hibbo, you've been, you're also heavily involved in the carbon credit space, but we just want to go beyond the world of carbon credits and biodiversity credits and have a look more at, while they are, while credits are a necessary measure in order to make the transition, what, where do we go from there? And, that, and that's what I want to go into. <coughs> Excuse me. So, moving to the first question. Hopefully that set the context, and, and I think, just a very upfront question. Looking beyond carbon and biodiversity, as I mentioned, and that's irrespective of whether that's in the voluntary market or compliance space, but looking beyond that, James, I suppose this one will go to you. What, what do you see as the principal drivers of return in a, if it can be described as such, but in a common or garden natural capital investment vehicle? What should people be looking to as the key deliverers of return if they were to make an investment or an allocation to natural capital? Yeah, thanks, Henry. Um, yeah, I, I very much take a sort of fundamental value market-based approach to, to natural capital. Um, so that means you know, looking at from the sort of asset level up. So looking at very much from a sort of real estate land perspective, number one, and then sort of building a fundamental business case on, on top of that, whether that be agriculture, forestry, agroforestry, ecotourism. So you've got to have some sort of sort of core proven business model in place first. And, and I think also you know, what I'm trying to do is, is, and I believe this is very important to the future of natural capital, is linking nature with productivity uh, and you know, protecting of nature as a sort of standalone asset through avoided deforestation credits, for example, is, has a place. But I think in terms of a viable asset class and in terms of sort of restoring land that's already been sort of degraded or destroyed is, you know, that actually has much more sort of additionality. But, but, but largely, to answer the question about returns, I think linking nature to these productive business models is, is pretty important. And then the sort of carbon and biodiversity piece comes into that. So, I mean, just to touch on carbon slightly, I mean, one model we're, we're, we're very much looking at at the moment is within value chain sort of carbon removals. Uh, linked to sort of to, to sort of green commodities, whether it be coffee or cocoa, and, and others, and to sort of help corporates transition away from a sort of unsustainable model to a sort of more regenerative model, and be able to sort of claim the carbon within that value chain transition, and therefore there's that sort of direct coupling of sort of carbon with with production. I think that is going to have a sort of big big future, and then. And then again, the sort of you know acknowledging the sort of biodiversity upside within inherent sort of habitat restoration and improvement of sort of more regenerative pr production models. So I think yeah, effectively what 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 we try to do, all the sort of strategies we look at, is effectively building this sort of yield stack, as I say, from the sort of ground up and having sort of much more sort of diverse revenue stream that that can provide a return early on is not overexposed to sort of policy and statutory changes, um, uh, uh, but still, you know, has in place a significant sort of future upside opportunities if the sort of carbon biodiversity and other sort of more, more pure play natural capital markets evolve as we, we expect and hope they, they will evolve. I would agree to that. And I think what we discussed previously with regenerative ag it's, I think carbon might be an incentive, but at the end of the day, it's about increasing net margins for these businesses and over time also building the resilience in those returns because we're talking about productive assets. So how do we retain that value over time? We can't just look to the next 24 months. We need to look at it like we do with infrastructure. 
what do the next 20 years look like and how can we ensure that the cash flows from these assets are preserved. So I think the, the sort of natural capital aspect has to be considered also from a risk point of view. So when we yeah. discount our cash flows, we need to look at the volatility as well in our businesses because we know for a fact now that returns are increasingly volatile. So how do we incorporate that when we look at these assets? Well, I mean, that's, that's absolutely bang on. I mean, that, that's from, again, the approach that, that, that I very much sort of uh, follow. And, and I think, again, answering your question about returns, I think people are very focused on, okay, what is the cash flow returns? Well, that's only one half of the equation. You've got to look at, as you said earlier, the risk-adjusted return, which is, you know, what are the, what are the risk components? And, and that's important, obviously, whatever that business or asset is producing, whether it be yeah, coffee, carbon, whatever, yeah, how, what is the volatility of that, that income stream? But, it, but it's also the risk component, in my view, is then going to be translated into effectively the, the pricing, not only of the commodity, but also the value of the underlying asset. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, if you look at sort of real estate-based investment models and you take a sort of total return approach to it, the, most of the return actually comes from the, the sort of exit value that's related to the underlying asset and, and land. So, yeah, my view is that, 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 yeah, there's a huge value play in acquiring undervalued land, <coughs> restoring that, improving that, making it more productive, more resilient. And as the market matures and becomes more efficient and recognizes that over the next five, 10 years, there's significant value upside in, in the future. But I think, you know, the whole point is we are sort of slightly playing off future value, future market opportunities that I think some investors sort of struggle to get their their heads around because there isn't a huge amount of sort of market evidence and proof points to say, okay, returns are sort of whatever, 12 to 15% for these types of strategies. But, you know, it's not an excuse not to do it. I think you sort of just got to try and marry existing business models that are proven with future upside strategies relating to natural capital. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes beyond because now we're talking about this sort of primary asset base, uh, the land and the soils and the forest. But even if you go beyond that, so the corpus that you're working with, they're also recognizing that they need to work throughout their whole supply chains because they're much more volatile and they also need to ensure that they're doing it in an equitable, nature positive way because that also shapes the, the branding and the pricing or the yeah. share price, if you like. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I would say that 100% of our economy is dependent on nature, not just yeah. you know, because eventually everything that we do, everything that we produce and consumes relates to nature. So I think we can look at it from a primary asset base, but it goes across the whole uh, value chain. Is it safe to say that you voted for the nature side yesterday during the debate? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, I, I did just want to pick up on a point you, you, took, you mentioned, sort of just key phrase, which was about, uh, fine, you talked about carbon credits enabling the transition in, in things like regenerative agriculture, but ultimately it's all about increasing net margins. A lot of what we've discussed there was very much focused on outputs, um, you know, about sort of how the outputs are, are creating, are driving return and creating value. Um, is it about sort of, I mean, there's, there's a maximizing building resilience into the outputs. It is, is it worth considering the reduced level of inputs as a material driver of return? Is that something that people should be looking for as well? Um, or, or is that sort of just an added benefit that increases the net margin but doesn't really drive the return profile? No, I, absolutely. And, and I know we had a whole session on food production, but if you look at the energy crisis and the Ukraine um, uh, situation, that led to all of the input prices increasing multiple folds. So if you look at fertilizers, went through the roof. So of course, if, if you're less reliant on inputs, then then you're going to increase the margin. So it's a play of increasing production capacity, being less uh, reliant on inputs, and eventually also the whole ecosystem around it, because pollination or lack thereof is a massive cost in both in the UK and, and in Europe and elsewhere. So it's all these added benefits over time as well. Okay. 
Cool. That's, that answers that clearly. Um, I want to come back to something you mentioned, James, about uh, you were talking about you talked about the yield stack or the revenue stack, um, and you I, I suppose you also mentioned the term around you know you're applying future value things you know cash flows that haven't really materialised yet, and you're 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 applying that to sort of the valuation methodologies as a, as a sort of driver of return. I suppose I wanted to ask about you know is it where we are now? is that kind of revenue stack of disaggregated revenue streams for various natural capital services. And I'll give a couple of examples in a second, but is that, are they kind of realistic and material drivers of return at the moment? Um, or is it just sort of an incentive uh, that is aiming to enable them to be drivers of return at a later stage? So if, if, if I gave an example, if we look I think it was Chris Skidmore yesterday who mentioned the Enhanced Land Management Scheme, which has been released by the UK now, which is, I think, somewhere in you know, a couple of hundred different payments that are available on a per hectare, per metre squared, you know, on a, on a, on a, a variety of bases where you could, I, I, if I give an example here that I've got written down, um, you know, managing grassland with low chemical input means you receive £98 per hectare. Creating wet grassland for waders from your previous agricultural land is £547 per hectare. So, so these kind of revenue streams, are now fine, that's backed, that's government backed and subsidy and it's incentive at the moment, but it's a, again, it's trying to apply monetary value that soon should hopefully be valued, I guess, more by large corporates and, and the capital markets and they'll start sort of rewarding that kind of management. But at the moment, is that kind of revenue stack a realistic driver of returns? Is it can, are, are investment models being put together with... with yeah. I think it depends where you are and what you're looking at. Like, yeah. I think, you know, those more pure natural capital, whatever, contributing, you know, revenue streams, it's, it's largely depending on, on the strength of the policy, the statutory sort of policy behind that. And I think, you know, the UK is, is frankly a sort of leader in, you know, natural capital policy. And you know, we've got the Woodland Carbon Code, Peatland Carbon Code that are, much higher integrity than any other sort of voluntary carbon market. We've got sort of biodiversity net gain, which is you know, coming in as a sort of effectively a compliance biodiversity credit for developers in the UK. And then, yeah, the subsidy system is transitioning to this, this elms. But I suppose, yeah, people are building investment cases off the back of effectively policy. And, and therefore, you know, that's great where it works and we know what it is. But I mean, in the case of elms, there's some evidence we don't know exactly what that is and it's very asset specific so I'd, I think you, again you sort of build it in as part of a more integrated revenue profile but again like you've got to look at the risk around that as well so every every component of, of, of that yield stack has got effectively a, a different sort of discount rate that should be applied depending on you know policy risk the market risk how much we know is it proven so so there's a there's a degree of sort of variable discounting that needs to go into it depending on yeah how real it is effectively and, and, and I think so that's that's sort of the challenge and I think just linking to, to one of the other things you just touched on Hibir is is you know we talked yesterday about the intrinsic value of nature and that's great and you know it does good to there's all these stats around how much relying on nature but but I think that the sort of slight disconnect for investors you know what does that actually mean and how do we how do we make nature sort of real and, and tangible? Uh, and, and that can only be done through the, you know, the available sort of market systems that, that, that we have, either through, yeah, existing businesses and commodity value chains or, or carbon markets or policy-backed systems. But, a bit, but, it's, uh, but it's also about, you know, using the capital markets and adjusting how they price price these revenue streams and price the risk relative to, to, the, to these assets is also quite an important component. Um, I suppose it brings on to the first Slido question that I did have, which we're talking about discount rates and talking about revenues. And I guess just to gauge the mood from, we have a number of investors in the room, whether you've got your personal portfolios or whether you're sort of a professional investment manager or, or an institution. Um, first Slido question would be along the lines of, we talked about sort of some of the risks involved and It'd be interesting to know what, what people are thinking in terms of a standard return profile. If they were to make an investment into natural capital, what they might be looking at in terms of returns, given some of the risks around hope value, future value that we've um, that, that we've discussed. 
So I'll let that run for a little bit. Uh, we'll give it a, we'll give it sort of another 10, 20 seconds, and then we'll continue to monitor it. I mean, just the other point with the obviously the returns is it depends where you're investing. Like if you're investing in high risk markets like Brazil or Africa, parts of Africa, well, all of Africa, like Asia, emerging markets. Obviously, your 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 cost of capital, your you know your, your, your equity risk is is a lot higher as a sort of starting point. But then actually, the, effectively the. The, the value arbitrage opportunity is much more significant where you can effectively de-risk these assets then you know, the, the, effectively the, the, yeah, the difference between the unadjusted cost of capital and, and, and the sort of positive natural capital adjusted capital from delivering these investments and in the various interventions can unlock quite a significant risk premium as well. But obviously your turns still need to be adjusted relative to the, the other fundamental risks of where you're, where you're investing and operating. And I think from my point of view, it's really about driving change and transition. Mm -hmm. So I see all of these nature-based solutions and incentives. It's almost like a new currency. So we, when we look at a country and the sort of condition and state of the country, we look at the currency. That's sort of an indication of the state of the country. And equally, I think, when we speak of the state of nature, we can do this by looking at these different stacks, because I think what we've seen gone wrong in a, in a way is when we just focus on one component and then we miss the holistic picture of what nature actually does and how it plays into the values. So I think that just shifts our culture to actually value because at the moment, it might be difficult to quantify, but once you start creating these incentives and stacks, then hopefully that will shift the culture and, and the market will be able, uh, with the right governance structure in place, to David Chen's question yesterday, we need to be careful as well to have the uh, right safeguards to drive this transition and market mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like hopefully we'll, we'll come on to a little bit of that in, in, yeah. in, shortly, I think. But um, just sort of looking at the results there, I mean, covering a return spectrum from, uh, let's say, the average is between 5 and 15%. So um, I just, you know, that covers, you know, the low risk at the sort of 5% five end, uh, five end of the spectrum, all the way up to 15 which I suppose is starting to get towards the riskier end. And I wanted to ask your opinions on what kinds of mechanisms are there to de-risk Investments. So you, you've already touched on it a couple of times, but you know what, what kind of mechanisms are we seeing? What kind of innovations are we seeing that might help might help de-risk investment into natural capital to encourage the yeah. capital flows towards it? Yeah, I mean, I'll just give you an example of a fund where, in the process of sort of designing, launching at the moment, which is effectively a sort of tropical tropical forest uh, focused strategy. So emerging markets uh, investing in land and the operating businesses and, and then sort of partnering with corporates as off-takers. So breaking those down into components, obviously investing in land in some of these emerging markets is, is pretty high risk, uh, uh, but we're sort of de-risking that by putting in place effectively sort of in, uh, investment guarantees or in sort of insurance products. So with MEGA and other sort of potentially USAID. So, so there's a degree of... Uh, downside protection on sort of land expropriation risk, which is a sort of key one if you're doing any sort of real asset strategy in, in these places. Uh, the other, then sort of moving up the value chain, so to speak, is, is the second key one from an investment perspective is, is having these, these large corporate off-takers in place, because obviously you're de-risking the, the, effectively the sale of your, your commodity on these sort of long-term off-take off contracts with you know, significant sort of blue chip companies. So that's a, that's a sort of second key, key component. And then the third is, you know, actually, I suppose, do, doing this properly and, and, and applying, you know, the higher degree of sort of integrity and, uh, and, and, yeah, really, you know, the highest, best, well, going way beyond the standards in terms of Im impact and, and sort of natural capital restoration and reporting and performance and, and you know, as I say, not only meeting the sort of various regulations, but, but linking that impact performance to effectively the value strategy and sort of showing over time the transparency of how, yeah, implementing these natural capital interventions has actually 
unlocked a premium for the commodity, it's unlocked a premium for the, for the underlying asset value, and, and actually sh transparently showing that, that, that story is another way of sort of de-risking that, that future yeah. exit value. I think an interesting point you touched on there and, and, and drawing again the parallel to some of the successes of the energy transition or partial success, obviously we've still got a long way to go. But um, about the long-term offtake agreements, and you're seeing yeah. you know, a huge amount of it in terms of PPAs and, and ultimately I guess that's also coming from societal pressure on the corporates for wanting to see a more responsible yeah. approach to procurement practices and they want to secure rights over better produced product. Uh, I'm sorry, Ivano. Again, so, I mean, just another. So, if we if we take our sort of UK investment strategy, another one we're really pushing is actually moving Defra away from a sort of grant-based approach and a subsidy-based approach to an outcomes-based approach, and employing what happened in renewable energy in terms of getting sort of contracts of difference type model for them to effectively, you know, offer that sort of floor price for mm -hmm. for, for carbon. And I think you know. If, if we manage to do that, um, you know, that will change the game in terms of UK natural capital investing and de-risking. And you're also seeing it in the sort of sovereign space. So yeah. uh, looking at countries now reissuing their debt where a component, so the interest rate is reduced and the difference in the rates that they pay are then invested into nature, which is such a clever solution, I think, because then you sort of get the government endorsement backing these solutions, then at the same time, you're providing the financing tools on scale to deliver these solutions. So I think there's so many um, aspects that need to work together. So to your, you know, the phrase of your conference here, it really is about collaboration. I don't think that the private markets can do it in isolation. There needs to be collaboration with with governments and, and with MDBs and, and the SSAs, et cetera, to, to work together to provide these solutions on scale, exactly like we saw in the renewable energy transition. But I think it's how, like people were talking about blended finance for a yeah. long time, which I actually don't think is the right model, but it's how, it's how that public money comes in. For me, mm -hmm. it's much better coming in under a sort of outcome contracts of difference type thing and or, you know, in the case of the Venith thing, there is a place for sort of first loss type money within, within that, which is sort of blending, but yeah. 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 I think muddling government money as part of your, you know, crowding in investment is, is probably, it makes things more complicated. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I suppose we've looked at a lot of the, been talking there about drivers of return and, and de-risking. I think turning to a sort of more practical thing, because again, we talked, I mentioned earlier that this is still a fledgling space. You know, people are trying to navigate it, figure out where those returns are coming from, how to de-risk it. You talked about new insurance products or new underpinning subsidy regimes that, that would help to de-risk this. Uh, a question for the audience in the next slide, a question we have was going to be around from an investor perspective, from an investment management perspective, from a personal perspective, but what, what are perceived to be some of the barriers to investing in natural capital assets. So um, this is a free text option, uh, no easy click. But uh, you know, if you'd been thinking about investing in natural capital from any perspective, what has prohibited you or what, what have been some of your reservations? Or if you have invested, what have been some of the things that you've really been thinking about? It's a question to you and we'll, we'll see you there, <laughs> pop it. Directly linked to returns. We'll, we'll let that continue to, I mean, Perhaps it's here. Oh, we're getting a few coming through. But I'll, I'll open it up to you guys and, and we'll, maybe we'll come back to the screen and what's on there. And, I mean, from your perspective, mm -hmm. some of the barriers that are preventing capital deploying into natural capital assets. Yeah, I, uh, thank you. <laughs> so I think there are multiple levels. I think um, at the core, it's probably the lack of bankable projects. So I think there's probably not enough projects available or investment opportunities and particularly not on scale. And I think what's linked to that is also the in-house capability to assess the opportunities because these are, especially nature-based solutions, are very dynamic and you really need very particular expertise to assess those opportunities. So for me, I think it's a combination of um, a bankable project scalability, knowledge and capacity. And I also think, um, I know you, you were a bit averse to it, but I think it's also government endorsement. So 
the government also signaling that it is a priority and something that they support, support for, especially from a governance point of view? Oh, I, I would agree. I mean, the supply side for me is the biggest, one of the biggest constraints. Um, and, and, but actually, you know, not just projects, but actually you know, the, getting them up to sort of ticket sizes that are interesting for institutions, which means you have to effectively take some development risk in terms of sort of aggregating and bundling a number of sort of deals together. Um, and that's, that's just something I think you've got to do, but I mean, not, not here to sort of plug Palladium, but, but part of my interest in sort of joining them was, was to try and sort of work the problem from the other end. And because, you know, having access to projects and operators and developers is, is a key piece. Uh, and then sort of working to sort of package that together into a sort of investment ready opportunity and then then bridging that with the sort of capital markets demand so so I think yeah pipeline I agree sort of capacity around you know people within these investment teams even you know other teams have been set up specifically to invest in climate and nature often those people don't actually know how to do these deals uh, and and again coming back to how do you price risk around these opportunities and, and actually just get comfortable on it. And, 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 uh, and then I think related to that is the sort of psychological factor around just market confidence mm -hmm. and just having the sort of the guts to, to, to do it. And I think people so far haven't really got there. Uh, I mean, we're working with a couple of institutions who I think, you know, are there and it's going to be really exciting to see that, you know, somebody come onto the market and go pretty big and, and pretty ambitious. And I think that's all, it almost needs that to get everyone else sort of comfortable. Um, but yeah, ultimately there isn't a huge amount of evidence. There's not a huge amount of data like, and, and if you want to invest in it, you have to take some degree of risk. And, and, and uh, I think that's just, that's just where we are. But it's still, if you look at the fundamentals going forward, then, then I think the value case is very strong. I think We've probably largely hit quite a few that came up there. Scalability and pipeline of projects were on there. Um, and on, a, on a couple of occasions, they've actually gone off the bottom of the list and I can't access the remainder of the answers on here, but, but, but they were all in the same vein. Um, the one point, I think, one that did go off the bottom was data. Um, and you just mentioned it as your last yeah. point. Are we starting to sort of see some successful projects where, you know, people are really making a compelling story and a compelling business case, thinking to what Tim said yesterday about narrative where you're yeah. seeing these kind of revenue stacks materialize, you're seeing the land value increase, that underpinning land value that's the, at the center of the asset. And that's increasing as well as the increased, you know, productivity of the site and extra payments for yeah. whether it's credits or whether it's, you know, something like under the Elms regime. Are we starting to get that data? Is the outlook positive for compiling that data set so that the, the space has, tra has track record that you can then put in front yeah. of the big institutional investors and say, look, this is the returns profile over the last X years. I think people like, everyone loves to talk about data as being a constraint, right? But I think there's two different parts to data. There's the data, like the sort of natural capital data and accounting frameworks and, you know, what, what does that mean in terms of soil and vegetation and all that sort of stuff? And there's a lot of sort of platforms that, that are becoming available to sort of tell you what you've got, but there's not a lot telling you actually what that means when it sort of converts into, into risk and return. But, so there's that piece, but then but I think the more powerful piece is, is the market evidence and just, yeah, having transactional sort of data points, which mm -hmm. we don't really have yet. But I mean, I suppose like Scotland is one example of where, you know, because there's been such an interest in sort of natural capital investing forestry, and you guys have been part of that, that, that demand curve for, for, for assets and estates. The land values have risen, I think, two and, two and a half, sort of three times from sort of marginal land in Scotland with the opportunity to plant trees. So, so yeah, I think on the land markets are starting to shift. Um, but, but, yeah, in terms of like successful, you know, long term returns, we haven't really, we haven't really got there yet. Yeah. Um, and one, I did want to move on from this question, but the point there that, that just struck me just came up was around liquidity as well. And is that just a, is, is that a, is that just a, a risk associated, I mean, call it a risk, call it an opportunity, but like, um, uh, is that a risk just associated with kind of real assets investing that people need to be comfortable with? Or, or is there, is there more to say around the liquidity within natural capital products? 
so there's a number of initiatives to improve liquidity, like the LSE initiative around carbon projects and development. So in a way, it's a structural issue, perhaps. And, and of course, it might be less uh, sort of conducive to match illiquid assets with a liquid structure. But we have seen it in the past, and there's a number of examples of listed investment trusts and, yeah. and companies. So I think that those are um, structures one can innovate and create. But, yeah. but, but generally speaking, yes, it's illiquid assets. Yeah. And, I, and I think, frankly, you want it to be illiquid in the first few years, because sure. most of these are development style projects where you've got to invest a lot of capital to plant trees or improve the soil or, or whatever it might be. Um, so you want that cap capital sort of locked in, certainly for sort of, you know, four, five years. Um, so I think that it's an, that's important. But then, we, you know, we are looking at like real, yeah, real estate investment trust, sort of partial exit type strategies once, once you're at a certain point. And I think, you know, that's, that's going to be important. I mean, last year, you know, we looked at a, a SPAC strategy around reversing assets into the back of the whole sort of SPAC run. So, so yeah, we're, you know, we're try, trying to look at those as, as sort of future options, but I think, yeah, at the moment we're very much in that sort of buy and build and start to operate phase rather than being able to offer too much liquidity. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Uh, and I, to continue from a point you mentioned there around some innovation that's going on with trying to address the liquidity issue to make it sort of, again, more appealing. Um, but keeping on the theme of innovation, you know, we, we kind of have a vision of where we need to get to. Uh, and we, we know where we are now. And we've talked about a number of things that sort of will help us get there. But what, you know, what else needs to happen to facilitate this change to natural capital investment being more mainstream? Um, societal shift in appreciation, uh, a, an adjustment of what people expect of their returns, long-term approach to sort of taking more of a long view on investments. I think we've, we've touched on a couple of these points, but just some of the innovation that's going on and what else needs to happen in order to start moving us in the right direction. So in my view, just to put it in context, and it might be a bad analogy to, to, uh, to me, but I think the innovation and shift we need to see is at par with the industrial revolution. So what we're facing here on every aspect of society, government, policy, investment is in the order of magnitude of, you know, it, it's significant. So I think um, if, if I were to sort of break it down into different components, I think one of the missing pieces, which you alluded to as well, it's really the quantification of outcomes. So we know that we need to, to save and restore and regenerate nature, but what does that actually mean? How do we measure it and how can we value it? And to that end, there's a number of really exciting investment opportunities. So part of my role is to look at early stage ventures to support these endeavors. And so you have companies that work on traceability and nature crimes, so looking at supply chains to track the provenance of the produce used. You have eDNA, which measures the environment sort of DNA, and that is very informative in terms of seeing how different measures impact nature in a positive way. Um, and you have smart contracts and blockchain solutions that enables indigenous communities and, and um, local uh, communities to actually participate in restoring nature and get paid for it. So there's lots of really exciting innovation and it's available today. And equally, just in the whole sort of carbon biodiversity space, uh, there's lots of technology of monitoring using satellite imagery and correlating that with uh, outcomes and, and using AI machine learning. And, and that actually enables this to scale um, mm. in the order of magnitude that we need it to, because that will bring costs down and make it available to a lot of, of users. So there's a lot, I think, uh, that needs to be unlocked, but it's it's already developing, and I think it will be more widely 
uh, used uh, within you know, the next few years. So that's on the sort of quantification piece. Then I think innovation when it comes to governance is absolutely key because you can easily see how this could get in sort of the wrong structures. And I think one of the things hopefully we've learned now is we need to focus on the equitable outcomes uh, as well. We need to look at the sort of stewards of the land, be it the farmers in the UK or uh, the indigenous communities and there's how can we get them to participate and how can we also align values and incentives to be distributed to them as well. So yeah, you've painted quite a picture of an entire subset of natural capital focused tech investment that was available just in terms of quantification but yeah. enabling the focus on the outcomes which will enable those outcomes to be rewarded yeah. by, well, by any of the stakeholders really and sort of essentially maybe displace the government backed subsidy that will that, that is looking to incentivize it at the moment under the Elms regime for example but um, yeah that's, a, that's an interesting one the, the governance side of things yeah I mean I guess we're starting to see it creep in a little bit in certain areas again I refer back to Elms but you I mean James did you have any any thoughts well, yeah, I, mean, I, th I, so I do agree with that but I think it's like we're at this sort of phase where everything's like hugely fragmented in terms of these sort of technology providers. Like you got some guys doing, yeah, whatever, like uh, remote sensing based land cover stuff for, for carbon assessments. You got eDNA for parts of biodiversity, but it's all like all over the place. And I think that needs to be sort of consolidated together into a sort of easy one stop shop type mm -hmm. solution and sort of build in efficiencies there, uh, uh, and similarly for, I, mean, I should have said this earlier, in terms of the risks and constraints is, is like operators is a, is a key one, operators and developers, and you know, particularly in, well, UK and tropical markets, you've got these sort of small little guys doing a bit here, a bit there, but, but again, it's not really a sort of investable scale, and like how do we sort of aggregate and professionalize those guys, because that effectively, yeah, if you're an investor, you need an off-taker, but you need an operator who can deliver that product, whatever it is, um, so that's a, that's another one, um, uh, and 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 yeah, the, the land piece again, it's around, it's very fragmented. You're going to be doing lots of little deals. I mean, you're looking at cocoa, for example. I think the majority of cocoa farms are under one hectare, whereas you know we want to be investing in hundreds of thousands of hectares. Um, so, so so that yeah, we need to sort of get real on, in terms of doing you know aggregating all of that sort of fragmentation together. But I think to, to your point about like drivers, I think, yeah, po policy is, is going to be a key driver, right? Even at a government level or, you know, we're seeing, you know, the impact of a sort of SBTI and SBTN on corporates and sort of making them move is, is massive. Uh, and I think, you know, once you get that, that, that momentum around some of these big companies, uh, then the investors are going to sort of, you know, move with that. Um, cool, I'm conscious of time and I did want to ask one sort of final point, uh, you know, again, to sort of gauge the room and, and also see if we can help provide a little bit of guidance, but in terms of where natural capital investment sits within the investment uni universe in terms of asset allocation. And um, I think we'll, we'll start by bringing up the last Lido question and then, and then come straight to you guys, but it's like, where does natural capital as an investment vehicle, oh, I think that's a... Uh, all of the questions, this is the one, yeah. So to the audience in the room, the question is, have you, be that personally um, or as part of your organization, but have you made an allocation to natural capital as part of your investment strategy? And that's whether you've considered natural capital as an asset class in and of itself, or whether you've considered natural capital as part of, uh, as part of an investment into another sort of asset class. So just seeing whether people feel like they have exposure to it, whether they have access to it, um, or whether it's sort of still being underserved. But from a general perspective, question to you guys, where do you feel natural capital investment sits within the broader context of asset allocation? I think re real assets, for sure. Um, but obviously there's certain sort of, again, liquidity restrictions, solvency too, within sort of portfolios. But I think, yeah, it's got to be part of a sort of real asset type, type strategy. 
And do you think it has to fit into the subcategories of real assets? So do you think, you know, in order to get that capital mobilised into it, it needs to sit within ag or timberland or, you know... No. It doesn't. So is there a, is there a case for a new subsector of real assets being generated that people start to get comfortable I mean, with? I like, I'm not... I think also one of the problems is with nature is you know, people sort of try to reinvent the wheel around, you know, how, how do we account for this? How do we, you know, make policy up? How do we sort of value this? But actually we should be using the existing sort of capital markets and, and investment and economic stuff we have, but just adjusting that to sort of suit natural capital uh, and, and uh, you know, rather than sort of starting again. Um, but, but, but yeah, it does require a degree of adjustment. I think that's certainly when I've been trying to raise capital from certain funds like insurance funds, for example, pension funds, often, you know, if you don't fall into their buckets, then you sort of miss out. Uh, and then you sort of put, try and re-engineer your strategy to sort of fit the buckets, which actually is the wrong way around. You should be yeah, designing the best strategy to, to solve the problem. But so, I mean, it's a bit of a waffly answer. I mean, I don't really know, but I think we need, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't necessarily invent a whole new asset class. We should build it within the mm. broader structure, but not, not say, okay, it's got to be ag, it's got to be forestry. It's just, you know, if it has a sort of land... land appreciation of it. If it has a land component, they're cool. If it has a sort of commodity component, whether it be beef or coffee or timber, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's commodity plays that obviously, you know, sometimes are linked to real asset plays, but, but equally you can, you know, do that separately. I think what you touched on there links closely to what Mark said, who, who chaired the debate yesterday, you know, about the, the capital markets needing and starting to show a direction of travel towards valuing nature a lot more intensively as part of, well, company valuations and whatnot, but um, it kind of links slightly to that. The, the capital market appreciation of nature is probably going to be one of the largest drivers that will see capital deploy towards nature-related outcomes. Yeah, and, and, and again, I mean, I would advocate, again, a real asset type approach because that's where I see the highest sort of value adjustment. I mean, you can see it now. If you sort of buy a degraded land in Brazil and convert it to an agroforestry model, you're already getting a gain of sort of two to $3,000 a hectare after all of your capex has, has been deployed. But, but, and then going forward, you know, as the market adjusts and becomes more efficient, the premiums there are going to be significant. But so... so yeah, that's, that's where I would come at it from. And I would say it's already being relabeled. So you could initially see how all the big institutional asset managers called it ag timber, then they relabeled to real assets. And now you can see the Nuveens and the Macquaries of this world calling it natural that's capital. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, terminology is another fun yeah. one, right? Like, yeah. there's all this stuff flying around, nobody really knows, like, natural capital, MVS, natural infrastructure, what does that mean? But, so I think, yeah, there's going to, again, uh, uh, there's got to be a period of consolidation around what, what this stuff actually means. But, but, yeah, I think we should use the existing tools and systems that we have and just sort of adjust them to, to fit, you know, the natural capital sort of asset class and the risk and return dynamics that are specific <laughs> to that. Um, Great. Well, I mean, conscious again of time, and I think uh, I will check whether we've got five or ten minutes left. Five minutes left. Uh, cool. In which case, I, there, there was certainly, I think, Rob, you had one question that came up as part of the last survey, but I think it was an interesting one. I don't know whether you meant it as a question or as a comment on the last one. Can I put you on the spot and ask you to uh, repeat it? Um, and then as well, if anybody else had any questions, we've probably got time for one or two more. Sorry, yeah, it's just there. Um, yeah, just trying to remember the question now. Um, I, th I think it was just flagging the point when we're designing forest properties, thinking about carbon income streams, biodiversity credits. You know, these are sometimes 30 year contracts, or sometimes 100 year contracts, so arguably quite long term. But in land management terms, that's short term. And these are one time interventions, you can only be additional once and you're supposed to be permanent but once you've kind of made that change and you get the credit for it and someone pays you for it that is a, a kind of one hit one their income stream you've been paid once and that's it and it's just how do you guys 
think about the longevity thing is how, how do you address that you know what's keeping the stewardship you know I'm, I'm talking sort of five generations plus you know 200 years uh, that sort of thing how do you guys think about that when you're looking at your land use designs and things can I uh, yeah, go ahead. so uh, from my point of view I think there's been so much focus which I understand on the whole additionality piece but Equally, I think we need to acknowledge, and it's the same thing in agriculture, so how do you incentivize people who are already doing good, so preserving what is already there, because I think it's one thing to improve, but then you have to sustain it. So I think we also need to incentivize people to sustain and preserve uh, what's good. And, and there's lots of research as well in terms of the the importance and significance of what we already have so the forests that we already have versus the scope of planting new trees so i think we need to and that's the danger uh, when you try to uh, create these instruments when when you don't think through all of the outcomes because i think the, the sustaining good practices is absolutely critical no, so sorry, sorry, just to add to that, do you, do you therefore think that there could be a case for a almost a sort of low volatility standing charge for permanence? You know, there's the additionality payment and then there's a kind of like a debenture where you're just paying that person to keep it in its state. I mean, that might be where it goes, but obviously that's so far out and capital markets don't tend to, to think that far. But it, it, yeah, one way of doing it. And, it, and it's not that far out when you look at agriculture. So if you look at the J curve of transitioning to regenerative ag, and then, I mean, that lead time is much shorter. So I think it's something we need to address sooner rather than later. I mean, I'll just add, again, linking it, I think, to, to us, the underlying asset security and actually by, well, one, not relying just on a sort of carbon new revenue stream, actually having a sort of more diverse business. You're not just relying on that sort of one hit carbon thing, but in terms of the permanence, then I think, yeah, the acts of restoring and protecting and enhancing those intrinsic values can then be linked to the other businesses and the underlying land value. So there's an incentive to do so above and beyond just selling carbon credits. And then I think long term, you know, there's got to be some sort of legal covenant protection around around that, you know, if, if you sell the portfolio, whatever it, it be. So there's, there's, yeah, I think there's some different market and sort of legal mechanisms that need to have a place. Cool. I mean, we're very nearly at time. Unless there was one burning last question, we might be able to address it quickly. But if there's no hands in the room, it's going. Oh, one very quickly, if we could, Ellie, please. Um, and if we keep the answers as short and punchy as possible. Uh, but yes, go for it. I think hopefully it can be quick. Um, I'm interested to know if there is, if there are particular sectors that you're seeing as being much less risk averse and are investing into natural capital. Because I mean, I'm coming at it from a food, re food retail perspective and we're way too scared. And it should be very material to our supply chains. We absolutely should be the first ones to be um, thinking about investing in natural capital because it's so, integral to food production, but the reputational risk is still too big. We don't want to be the first mover. We don't want to inadvertently ruin it for everybody, basically, by getting it wrong. So, so who, who is investing, basically? Is it tech? Is it aviation? Like, I, yeah, I'm quite interested to understand that. Um, so which commodity or which? Um, in quite a general sense, who, what are the kind of companies that you see as being really open to investing in natural capital more so than others, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we touched on it when we chatted at breakfast, but I mean, I think there's, there's certain corporates that we're talking to who are, you know, interested, interested partly because they're being pushed by SBTI, etc., but partly because I think, you know, they want to... Uh, build resilience into, into where their commodities come from, and, and those are well, Nestle, Mars, Unilever. All these guys are, you know, actively engaging in, in transitioning to a sort of more nature-positive, you know, carbon-positive sort of supply chain. But they're 
not wanting to commit their own balance sheet to, uh, to, to making that transition. So this sort of, I suppose, an additional point is that's where for, I think there's an opportunity for investors to sort of, you know, plug, plug that gap for, for the corporate demand um, and effectively move capital to where it's needed most, which is effectively up, upstream in these value chains and, and sort of converting the, the farming and production side to a sort of natural capital regenerative nature positive approach that then, yeah, solves the, some of the bigger corporate demand. Great. Well, I think, I think we're definitely a couple of minutes over time, so we'll draw stumps there. But um, thank you very much.